Well, it looks like the sun is actually going to break a little bit this morning and then maybe start raining a bit later. So I'm going to head down this causeway road across the marshes and I want to try something different today. I want to try and lay up there and see if I can get some shots of waders. I don't know if it's going to work. I've never been that keen on doing it before because it's actually quite easy to photograph from a car here. But the second thing, it's also really easy to get tick bite fever from the ticks in the grass. So I'm in two minds. The problem with African bird photography quite often is uh, the exposure not just to dangerous wildlife, but dangerous diseases too. I can see some flamingos over there. And I'm hoping to see some, maybe some stints or something like that. Small waders that I can get low down and photograph. Let's see what I can turn up. My gosh, the mud is smelly at the moment. And, and, the water is so much higher than it was the last time I came down a couple of weeks ago. And that's a problem, because in order to photograph waders, you really need exposed mud or sand. And that's because that's where they feed. And if the water's too high and that mud isn't exposed, well, the birds just aren't there. So I haven't actually seen any uh, little stints or roughs or anything like that to photograph yet. Just the usual suspects out here. Some greater flamingos, some gulls, and a lot of red knobbed coots. There's quite a lot of activity over in the tops of the reeds and the grasses over on my left uh, from various species, but mainly I'm interested in the red bishops. Red bishops uh, have summer plumage, which is quite striking. The red sort of back and black bodies. And they display from the heads of reeds and tall uh, grass stems, and puff their chest out and sing and chase the females. And I'm undecided how to photograph these guys because I'd like to get a little bit closer and, and I'm just thinking how I can do that most efficiently. So I'm thinking I might get my tripod out, try and sneak up a bit closer to them, and wait. And it might be quite a long wait for them to come back and to uh, settle down after I move out of the vehicle. It's a bit of a problem. A lot of my wildlife photography is based around recognizing behaviors and patterns. I find it's a much easier way to capture something interesting or just to afford yourself the opportunity to get closer to the wildlife or the bird life. And these uh, bishops in summer uh, are typical of the patterns that I like to try and exploit because they make it easy for me and they're quite attractive birds. And this habit of theirs of controlling territories that I can approach and exposing themselves on high pieces of reed or grass and singing with that chest puffed out, I think really helps me capture them doing something that they're well known for and exhibiting a behavior that's interesting. And I like to seek those kind of things out. Uh, and try and exploit them in my photographs. Uh, I find that that kind of thing, rather than concentrating on camera settings or equipment or, you know, it's, it's a more rewarding way of exploring the wildlife. 
and uh, it lets you it lets you show that wildlife in quite an interesting way usually. I'm using a 400mm f2.8 lens with the 1.4 teleconverter on it and a crop sensor 7D Mark II body and that's giving me an equivalent focal length at full frame of around 896 millimeters, which is quite long. And even though I have that focal length here on this tripod, I'm still not trying to photograph birds that I feel are too far away for me. And it's a common mistake I feel that I made when uh, I first started bird photography, was always trying to photograph whatever I saw uh, especially if it was an exciting species. That's fine for record shots, but it doesn't work for nice photography. To take a decent shot of a small bird, you need to be relatively close to it. So I'm only really considering shots about 10 meters or less away from me. Now the birds aren't really approaching closer than seven meters. So I've put the focus limiter on here to seven meters to infinity and I'm then trying to photograph anything that comes within my range which I feel is close enough to me to render a decent shot and that's about 8 to 10 meters for these small birds. Now these changeable conditions are also making things quite tough because I enjoy shooting manual mode most of the time I find that I I like that degree of control and the difficulty with that in these conditions with the shifting clouds overhead and the shifting light and shadow is that you have to keep thinking about it. Uh, and I'm not shooting a mirrorless camera which would show me the exposure in the viewfinder. And then that's actually something I'm, I'm quite looking forward to perhaps in uh, any mirrorless upgrade that I make. So I'm keeping a constant eye on that exposure and then just gauging it depending on the species of bird that I'm shooting or the color of the bird that I'm shooting more appropriately. So for a darker bird, I'm going to overexpose the shot by about a stop and a third. And for a lighter bird, I'm going to just keep it around uh, even exposure because the lighter birds match the background that I'm in at the moment. So as that light shifts and change, I have to change as well. And what I'm changing is, uh, is my ISO. I'm leaving the shutter speed and the aperture alone and just moving the ISO up and down to give me the exposure that I want for the bird that I'm shooting. I'm trying to capture another bishop, but this time in flight. And he's helping me out with this repeated behavior, this territorial patrol that he's on. He's patrolling between perches in his territory and he returns to the one in front of me every five or 10 minutes. So I've positioned this particular reed in front of a clump of more distant reeds to try and get a nice tonality and shade and color to that background instead of the bright silver or the bright gray of the sky. It also helps to reduce the dynamic range in the shot. Now the other considerations I've had to think about to try and capture this guy in flight is to actually pull back with the focal length. Now I'm not shooting a zoom, I'm shooting a prime. And I had a two times teleconverter on it, which made it an 800 millimeters, pretty extreme. So what I've done is I've swapped out that two times teleconverter for a 1.4, which makes this lens now a 560 F4. So it's a much wider frame than it was before. It's mounted to my Canon 7D Mark II, and this is a high frame rate camera. It can capture 10 images per second. Now the bird is traversing from one side of the frame to the other in one shot. So the other 10, are wasted. So I need to be fast to get this guy. At the same time, that reduction in focal length has helped deepen my depth of field. It's a natural corollary to reducing focal length. I'm shooting the bird 
At f10, I'm shooting at one two thousand five hundredth of a second to try and freeze him in the shot, and I'm letting the ISO ramp up to two and a half thousand. So it's a bit of a dark and dingy day. I'm shooting quite a deep depth of field and quite a high aperture, and I'm hoping I'll get a couple of shots of this guy. And he's really helping me out by doing this cyclic patrol this afternoon. I'm in a fairly unpromising hide at Maryville, one of my least favorites. And the reason it's not a good hide is because there's a wide open expanse of water on three sides, usually a strong wind blowing directly towards it, and no exposed mudflats or reeds nearby. So it doesn't attract very many species. But there's one exhibit of behavior that I really enjoy at this height. The wind blows strongly across the open water towards me. The prevailing wind is from that direction this way. And it eddies around this area on the left of the hide. So there's much less, less wind pressure in this area. So what happens is the terns fly along the bank of the river hunting. And then they experience this low pressure area and find that they can fly into it much more easily. And they turn and they fly past this window about five meters away. It makes for an absolutely brilliant place to catch them in flight. And if you're lucky, you can catch them hunting as well, or with the green of the reeds behind them. It's a really useful place. Uh, and I like noticing things like that because noticing these behaviors and these patterns can really help you uh, nail a shot because you can do it over and over again until you get a really nice one. The settings are a little tricky, a little tricky because what you have is this silver expanse of water, a narrow band of reeds, and a silver white expanse of sky. Uh, the birds do have black heads and uh, orange bills and uh, black patches on them. So they're, they're tricky birds to, to photograph and expose properly. So I'm back in manual mode. I, I like manual mode because it gives me that much more control. I know that the brightest part of this scene is the sky or the water. So all I'm doing is simply exposing for that. And I'm using uh, something from film photography called the zone system to do it. I know that I don't want to get into the zone system. I really don't. You can go and Google it. But I know that these white patches of water or sky are going to, be, going to be right at the right end of that system. Zone 8, zone 7. And that means I need to overexpose them two stops above middle grey. Once I do that, I know that they won't be blown. The white parts of the bird won't be blown. And the other pieces of the scene, the grass, which is a middle grey, the dark patches, which are probably two stops under middle grey of the birds, they'll all fall into place naturally because I've chosen to expose on that basis. It's a great way to photograph. I really like using it. You. That was a massive strike, lightning strike about a hundred meters away. Thank you.